Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Virtual Expo EM Spring 2021 Lecture Theatre. My name is Tim Easter, and I'm your host for today. A uh, couple of house rules. During these lectures, all attendees, other than the host, myself, and speaker, will be automatically muted. There will be an opportunity afterwards to ask questions during the Q&A. So for our third lecture today, there will now be a presentation of the layout Elmore, being built by a father and son duo of Gwyn and John Chivers, and their friend Richard Tucker, assisted by fellow modeler Vanessa Howells. The narration on the video, which you will see, has been done by John, but unfortunately he is unable to be with us today, so he has been ably replaced by Gwyn for the presentation. Over to you, Gwyn. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to our preview of the Layout Elmore for the EM Gage Society virtual show. As you will see, Elmore is currently work in progress. The layout is being built by a group of friends and we have just got the layout fully operational. From here, the next jobs now will be to continue completing the main structures and then we will move on to the scenics for the rest of the layout. The concept of the layout is a BR Western Region Terminus layout based in the mid 1950s. So predominantly ex GWR steam in early crest livery. The design includes two entry points very similar to what we see at Bodmin. So we have a main line and a branch line. And at the other end, we have a modest station, which has a main platform, a bay platform, a cattle dock, goods yard and an engine shed. Between the station and the entry points, we then have a section of double track line. This was something we'd seen at Falmouth when doing our research. We like the idea of having that extra operational flexibility. So you could bring a train in, hold it in the loop and then depart another train round it. The track work is a fairly standard construction. The normal plane track is exact to scale fast track. We also have a section of GDR concrete pot sleepers, which the concretes are produced by Model U by 3D printing. Uh, with CNL chairs then on top. The points are a mixture of the exacto scale and the CNL parts using thicker plastic timbers so they match the height of the fast track. Excluding the Y points, all of the points on the layer to be six length. We didn't want to go smaller than this as we wanted to keep the flowing feel of the longer points. The point operation is by the standard 9 gram blue servos as they are cheap and reliable and as we need servo controller for the operation of the signal servos it made sense to also use the same system to operate the points. The signals themselves are wizard model MSE parts with some extra 3D printed parts from Model U such as the finials and the lamp castings. The previous couple of layouts to Elmore, which are Bixdale and Shutt if you happen to know them, have both been fully DCC controlled layouts run from tablets or phones via a computer running JMRI. They have both proved to be very reliable layouts to operate, however using tablets to operate the layout is not for everyone. Some of us find using a tablet very intuitive and enjoy the benefits of a completely wireless controller, whereas others really struggle with it and the running of the layer becomes a chore. Elmore being bigger than the previous two layouts and needing more operators needed to be more inclusive in the way it was run. We had a few ideas but decided on a conventional looking panel but one where it talks to the computer and receives life information. Therefore, both the tablets and the panel can be used at the same time. Setting a route on the tablet prevents conflicting routes being called on the panel and vice versa. As with the previous layouts, the computer is running JMRI, which is doing all of the interlocking of routes, including the signals and points. Part of making the layout easy and reliable to use was to make the computer do a lot of the job for the operator. Apart from shunting, the operators don't have to think about points. 
they just press one route button and the points will all fire over. Any conflicting routes are locked out and then the signal is cleared. To cancel the route once you have travelled past the signal, you press the same button again and the signal is put back to danger. All of the point and signal commands are then sent out by the DCC system. For us this is the Digitrack system which we've used on all of our previous layouts. The server controller we are using is the Mega Points controller and we are using their DCC interface to then pick up the DCC commands. Also to improve reliability for exhibition use, all of our point frogs are fed using Tam Valley frog juicers. On previous layouts we have used these for changing the polarity of diamond crossings to great effect. Like all technology it's working at its best when you don't have to think about it at all. And these do work seamlessly. It's strange that on this layout you can drive into a trailing point which isn't set for you and the layout won't fail. You can just push through the points. All of our locos are fitted with TCS decoders which we choose for their good quality motor control. We fit to keep alive capacitors to, to them all as well and that allows the stock to do a minimum of a full wheel revolution without being connected to track power. Some of them will do considerably more than that. This is something to be mindful of when using the cassette for the yard as the old technique of pulling the cassette out to stop the train no longer works. In fact, you're no longer then connected to the DCC command station to stop the train. The fiddle yard we are using on Elmore is the cassette type, using 9mm ply for the base and 1 inch square aluminium angle for the running rails. We then use 2 inch flat aluminium as the cross supports for the cassette table. We have found on previous layouts that trying to produce a completely flat 4 foot long deck from wood that is also light to transport is a difficult thing to do. So we have deliberately made the deck 5 millimeters lower and any fluctuations of height is then taken out with different sized packing pieces under the aluminium. This will give a completely flat finish to the aluminium slides. The fill yard is a good example of where we have employed 3D printing for custom made parts. The most intricate of these pieces is in the transition piece which holds the short sections of aluminium angle at the correct height and gauge for the running rail. But it also includes a re-railer to help stop going onto the layout, just in case it was either put on incorrectly or it derails on the transition. As you can see, we have also used 3D printing to make the cassette end stops and the handles. We have found it a great technique for quick prototyping. Adjustments can be made to the diagram and then printed so within a few hours you can have the next version to try. The fiddle yard is probably where the 3D printing is most on show but actually there's lots all over the layout from the server mounts under the layout to the fine detail like the point rodding cranks and the underside of the bridge deck. In fact all of our structures have the main internal shell 3D printed in ABS plastic before being clad in Slater's plastic card. We will leave you now with a couple of sequences of trains running. All of the trains are in various stages of completion, but hopefully they will give you a feel of how the layout will be run and the look of the layout when finished. We thank you very much for watching and we give our thanks to the EM Gauge Society for having us. Hopefully it won't be long before we're all back at real exhibitions and we shall see you all there.
All right. Well, thank you very much, Gwen. My pleasure. I, I hope everybody enjoyed enjoyed seeing that. Um, we're uh, uh, it's been suggested that I talk perhaps a little bit more about some of the three D printed parts that we've got uh, that we've got on the layout. Um, we've um, virtually all I think all the structures on there have all been uh, have all been base printed with uh, uh, from three D. We draw them up on CAD first, and then and then produce a a structure. For the for whatever building, even the um, um, the supports, the, the bridge parapets, and everything else comes up in in that sort of manner. I've got one here. I've got a, a building here which is uh, uh, which I'm currently in the process of producing. So we so we end up with a structure that looks something something yes, you know, perhaps something like this, um, where it can then be infilled with the the windows, doors, uh, there's an in internal door there. Um, plus then we sheet the roof uh, before putting uh, before putting any tiling on it. Um, the whole thing on the outside is usually slated as plastic card, uh, embossed plastic card brickwork or, or similar to uh, and prior to painting. Um, the other thing that we do with the 3D is because we've got a resin printer as well, um, all the, all the windows and doors are actually then produced on resin, um, on a on a much more accurate, uh, much finer than the uh, than the ABS can print, um, and then they're they're then inserted in, inserted into place afterwards. They're designed down to uh, we measure the apertures, make sure that they're uh, that they're correct, and then we can uh, we can get those into place. Uh, on the underside of the layout, servo mounts. Uh, the servo mounts I designed back oh, quite a while ago for a, for a friend down at my local model railway club and then decided that I could, uh, uh, one or two people interested in them, so I put them up on eBay and they go, uh, they go quite regularly on there. Uh, in fact, somebody was talking, uh, talking to John at one point on, uh, I think on RM web, suddenly realized, oh yeah, we've got yours on, on our club layout. And so it, uh, yeah, they've, uh, they do go, go quite well. I do two sort of, or a couple of arrangements of those where they're either vertical or horizontal. Unfortunately, I haven't got any to hand uh, here with me at the moment, but uh, they are, uh, uh, they're around. You can find them on eBay if you, if you really want to look at them. Um, actually, I may, no, I haven't. Uh, so a lot. Uh, the just looking at the last shot on the video there on my other screen and saying thinking what else is there on that the even the bet the the benches if you know what I mean by the benches that's where the um, um, on the point rodding side the uh, the con the sort of concrete benches where they where they actually bolt. Um, uh, bolt cranks, uh, compensators, and such like onto, so that they hold the uh, hold the hold the cranks into the right sort of places. They're up in uh, uh, they're three D printed as well, so that, so the whole lot is uh, is done up in in that manner. Um, it's probably as much as I can say about it at the moment. Tim, have we got any uh, anybody come through with any questions? Uh, not as yet, but if anyone would like to ask a question, uh, please indeed ra uh, click the raise hand function on the uh, reactions at the bottom of the screen uh, and ask away. Uh, Roger Sawyer. Um, Gwyn, yes. um, all you're going on about the uh, um, uh, freezing printing, uh, it would be nice if you could sort of perhaps pen a note for uh, Steve on this and put it in the newsletter because that would be rather nice because 3D printing is a little sort of still still a bit new and old codgers like me are not all that up to it. So, uh, <laughs> if you could, it would be it would be very helpful, I think. I'm yeah. sure Steve would be interested. If he's not, I'll kick his... Yeah, never mind. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll make a note of that now, Rog. Okay, and, thank uh, you. I have got a 3D printer. Yeah. 
which I haven't used. Okay. Um, we well, have there, are, there are two. There are two essential types, but uh, we can. Uh, I can talk about that in uh, in the uh, in, in the note in the thing I do for uh, for the newsletter. I've I've got the squirty type one, not the one that's the resin where it appears out of the out of the the, the mist. If you know what okay. I mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. Same same as uh, yeah. We've got both here. So okay. Isn't right. it nice? Isn't it nice to have a, a very, uh, what shall I say, a rich club? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. Right, Ian Harrison. Uh, thanks, Gwyn. That, that that was really good, really exciting. This is a question about three D printing as well. Yeah. Uh, so I, I uh, noticed um, the uh, the Great Western Yard crane that was three D three D printed. Yes. So, is that one that you've designed and presumably that is quite slender presumably that has to be a, a, a fairly uh, fine resin it is a resin it's actually one um there is a brass two millimeter version of that which is uh i can't remember i don't think it's brass masters um I know my son found it somewhere, but it is there is a two mil version available, and and we've what we uh, what John did was to actually scale it up, was to re-engineer it from two mil up to four mil on measurement, and then it's uh, then it's been printed basically in essentially in two halves, the base unit um, and the and the jib as two, as two separate items, but they they are done in resin, yes. Right. Okay. Thank. Uh, and I presume so. You, so you have the uh, the design um, uh, for that, then? Do you? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Right. Any more for any more? Okay. Well. Thank you very much, Gwyn, for your fascinating uh, presentation and indeed explanation about 3D printing side of things. And Pleasure. Yeah.